straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here. Thank you that we get to continue to be learning from Paul and his letter to the Church of Philippi, a letter 2,000 years ago that is still so relevant to us today. Holy Spirit, would you fill me? Would you speak through me? Uh, would, would your words from, from your scripture resonate in the hearts of all of us here in the room? In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, first Paul starts off chapter 3 by kind of quoting and reemphasizing things that he's already been saying. He says, rejoice in the Lord, and it's no trouble for me to say these things to you again because it's a safeguard for you. I found this to be really interesting when I was studying this text because it's like, okay, so rejoice in the Lord. Why, why is this, quote, unquote, a safeguard? What are you guarding me from, right? What are you guarding me from? And, and here's what he's about to guard us from. And we're, let's just throw that up on, on the slide right now, that rejoicing in Jesus is the greatest safeguard to legalism, okay? Rejoicing in Jesus is the greatest safeguard to legalism. So Paul will go and spend the next five verses, one through six, is all about legalism and why it's just destructive for us okay so i want he i want you guys to like pay attention to the words that he uses in in verse two he uses the words dogs evildoers and mutilators of the flesh dogs evildoers and mutilators of the flesh it's not like when he says dogs like it's not like hey what up dog like how's it going dog you know um, it's not like that, and it's not when he's like saying dog is like some little cute little puppy that you can carry in your backpack and ride along, you know, or like the cute Instagram videos of dogs that you see. Um, I saw this one where there's like this white dog, and he's like skipping through, he's like happy dog or something like that. Uh, it's not like anything like that, okay? When he says dogs, these are like flea-infested dogs that will bite you, that are just nuisance to society, and that's the kind of image he's, he's giving to legalistic Judaizers is what they call them. People that said, hey, to become a Christian, to follow God, you need to be ethnically a Jew. So you got to convert to what we're doing. And there were three main identities for these Jewish people. Three main identities. The first is the land. If you were part of Israel and in that area, in, especially if you're in Jerusalem, like that's, one, that's a major identity. Law, right? Following the rules. And then temple. Land, law, and temple. These are three really important things for Jewish identity and yet, they're in Philippi. So they're outside of the land of Israel. There is no temple. So all they have left is their law. And so these people are like, hey, we got to follow the law to the letter, right? We got to follow it to the letter. So these people are so legalistic that new Gentile Christians, people that aren't ethnically Jewish, people that are coming to faith for the first time, these guys are being so exclusive saying like, nah, like, if you want to be like us, you got to literally be like us. You got to do exactly what we do. You got to dress exactly the way we dress. You got to, like, act the way we act exactly, right? And so they're, they're taking their ethnic pride to the point of being super exclusive that other people are having a hard time joining their community, having a hard time joining the church. And that's a problem. And so Paul uses really strong language, dogs, evildoers, mutilators of the flesh, because he's trying to throw a warning out, saying, like, don't be like these people. Don't be like these people who are so ethnically proud, so proud of what they're doing and rejoicing in their own ability to uh, accomplish the law or do the law that you become so exclusive to everyone else. So I like to think about it this way, right? Like you're a newcomer, you're trying to get involved into a new community, maybe you're trying to join this community and all of a sudden you're getting, you're getting judged on how you dress. Oh my gosh, did you see what she was wearing? Or you're getting judged on your language. Oh my gosh, like, he said a cuss word. She said a cuss word. Like, she said, dang it, crap. Oh my gosh, right? Or, you know, other words. And then you get judged on church attendance, right? You're not a Christian if you don't come to church. You can't be a Christian if you only come to church twice a month. Maybe it's behavior or things that you post or like. You know, maybe it's a list of accomplishments, right? Like, you're trying to join this community, but then all of a sudden people are whispering, people are talking or saying like, no, you can't do this, 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 this. You can't be like this. You can't wear that. Can't like this. Can't follow this. This barrier for entry to join the community becomes so big that people are like, I don't want to be part of this. This isn't love. This isn't the message that I hear about. This isn't representative of the person you claim to follow. 
Do I want to follow? Do, do I want to be part of this? You know? So Paul has really strong language for these people. And then Paul's like, look, like if you, if you want to like say, talk about ethnic pride, if you want to talk about things that you've accomplished, like look at me. You know, Paul then gives a huge list. He gives a huge list of the things that he's accomplished. A huge, huge list that is so, I guess, bragging rights, right? Definition of bragging rights. And he's like, yeah, I have all that. So, like, you guys shut up. <laughs> like, who are you to say that you, you can tell people this when I literally one up you in every single category, right? And he gives this really strong list. And it's the equivalent of, an Eagle Scout, homecoming king, valedictorian, full scholarship to an Ivy League, graduates with summa cum laude from college and becomes number one in his profession. Like, Paul's like, yeah, like, who are you guys to say that someone can't join a community when I literally one-up you in every single category, right? Because here's the thing, like, rejoicing in Jesus is the greatest safeguard to legalism because legalism, if we, if we like, try and pursue these things, if, it's going to be a crazy joy stealer or a joy killer, Trying to pursue these things is a crazy joy killer, joy stealer. And we'll, we'll hear a story at the end um, about that. But I just want you to keep this in mind that rejoicing in Jesus is the greatest safeguard to legalism. Because if you keep trying to pursue legalism, I promise you there's no joy in that. If I give you a list of all the things that you have to do in this life, right, to do right, you're going to be like, ah, that's not fun, right? Like, that's not enjoyable. That's not, I won't be happy. And Paul's just saying, like, hey, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Stop trying to pursue this whole list of accomplishments. Stop trying to, like, be all this and create barriers for entry. Just rejoice in the Lord. So then let's go to verses 3 through 10. I mean, uh, 7 through 10. Because here, here's the thing, right? When I just, I just talked about how Paul has this huge list of accomplishments. He says it um, in verses 5 through 6. And then he says this. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. So if we pay attention to the words that he's using over and over again, lost, the word lost or lost comes up three times, right? This is all my accomplishments, right? My entire sheet of paper of all the things that I've done, every reason why I'm better than everyone, why I'm number one, why I should be the best, all of this stuff, he goes, rips it up. I can't rip up my sermon because then I won't know what to do. Um, but he, he, just, he just says, like, it's garbage. It, it doesn't mean anything. It, it amounts to nothing. I consider it lost when it compares to knowing Jesus. My whole list of accomplishments, I was number one in my class. I'm the number one in my profession. I've accomplished all these things, and they mean nothing. And in fact, he uses the word garbage, which is what the NIV translates this Greek word to be. But um, some really smart scholar people, they say that the term literally means dung, excrement, or manure. Some scholars are prone to translate this as garbage, but it's actually used for dung. However, the strongest possible contrast makes the best sense in this passage, right? The strongest possible contrast makes the best sense in this passage. So he uses the word dogs, right? Dogs, evildoers, mutilators of flesh. And then he uses like dung, poop, crap, right? And this, ter this term, garbage, that gets translated here in the NIV, it's often associated with the excrement of dogs, Right? And so the strongest possible contrast, I'll leave that for you guys to interpret that um, with the words. But Paul's just saying, like, my whole list of accomplishments, everything that I've achieved in my life, everything, best college, got, got private tutored from the best scholar in the world, I became number one in my class, number one in my profession, I am known throughout the entire Mediterranean world for who I am, what I do, and how I've done it. He's like... Consider it all lost, my entire list lost, garbage, dog crap, for the sake of knowing Jesus. Because here's the thing, when Christ becomes our gain, everything else is viewed as loss. When Christ becomes our gain, everything else is viewed as loss. And 
And that's, I just want you guys to hear this. I know this is so hard. Like the more I, I understand and study and learn about Southern California culture and the elitism that takes place in the academic world here, I know that you guys are under crazy pressure. Okay, I know that you guys are under crazy pressure to perform. And I, I'm not saying don't perform. I'm not saying don't study hard. I'm not saying don't go to a great college. But what I'm trying to say is your life will amount to pretty much nothing at the end of the day when you stand before God and he's just like, so what'd you do for me? And you just say, hey, like, look at my nice resume. He's like, well, that, that's cool, but did, did you know me? Do you know me or do you just know about me? Right? You did all these things, but did you know me? So here, here's the thing, right? Um, Francis Chan, there's this book called Crazy Love. He wrote this book. I read this when I was going into my senior year of co- uh, high school, and I was coming back from a... Uh, uh, college camp to play basketball, and uh, I got cut in the final round, but I, I discovered this book when I was there. And so I, I read this page right the, the night before I went to go play, and this is this just thought, like, oh my gosh, this killed me when I was in high school. And then I finished the book when I got home and changed my life, changed my life. So this book is about being a lukewarm Christian, right? Lukewarm Christian. You're not on fire for God, but you're not totally away from God, so you're just right in the middle. Basically, you're fake, right? And so this is what he says to to lukewarm Christians. Has your relationship with God actually changed the way that you live? Do you see evidence of God's kingdom in your life, or are you choking it out slowly by spending too much time, energy, money, and thought on things of this world or our accomplishment lists? Are you satisfied being godly enough to get yourself to heaven or to look good in comparison to others? Or can you say with Paul that you, and then he's going to quote Philippians 3.10, which is what we just read, want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of, his suffer- of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And then this is the line that got me. This is the line that just wrecked me. For a long time, this verse had too much Jesus for me. For a long time, this verse, Philippians 3.10, had too much Jesus for me. In my opinion, the verse should have ended after the word resurrection. And this, this killed me because it's like, do I really want to know Jesus or do I just want to get things from him? Right? Like, do I really want to know Jesus or do I just want to get things from him? Is Jesus worth more or better than my list of accomplishments in life? And that's something that I, even now, like today, as a 27-year-old, even as a pastor, don't ever call me pastor, um, I still struggle with this. Like, do I really want to know Jesus? And that's why ever since my junior year of high school, Philippians 3.10 has become my my life verse. It's become my favorite verse. And my friend Leah, I've talked about her a lot. She she painted me this, um, which is Philippians 3.10. She painted it for me before I left. And on the back, she she just wrote, praying for you every step of the journey. Miss you already. Love your favorite sister, Leah. And so, you know, this is the ESV version, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. It's because knowing Jesus is, is so important because it changes the way that we live because when Christ becomes our gain, we view everything else as loss. It's like, ah, it's, you know what? Like, I didn't get into the number one school in the nation. Not, not a big deal. I know that Jesus, has a, Jesus is taking me somewhere else, and I can trust in that. You know what? I didn't get straight A's. I, I'm not as smart as everyone else. But that's okay because God made me this way, and I'm trusting in the plan that God has for me. I'm not the best scorer in the world, not the best singer in the world, not the best dancer, not the best performer, but I trust in the the way that God is writing the story of my life because I know that Jesus will carry me because I know the person of Jesus. See, this word know in the Greek, it's an intimate term. It means to really know someone, to really, really know someone. It's not like, oh, I know like these facts about this person. No, it's like a best friend kind of a know, like you've lived through enough stories, like last week, JP's praying over Caleb, and I don't know if you guys noticed, but he was crying up here, which I thought was awesome. JP, thanks for showing vulnerability and authenticity. You know, but he's crying up here because he knows Caleb. He knows how much this injury hurts his best friend. He knows the things that his best friend has gone through, and he just knows his friend. That is the Greek word gnosko, to know Christ. JP knows his friend, but Paul's saying, do you know Jesus, or do you just know about him, right? So when Christ becomes our gain, everything else is viewed as loss. 
Because following Jesus isn't about a get-out-of-hell-free card. You know, like Monopoly, get-out-of-jail-free. Following Jesus isn't about a get-out-of-hell-free card. It's a whole different level. It's about a way of life that changes the way that you view life, the way that you live life, because it's a life about joy. So I want to I keep going, right? Uh, verses 12 through 14, Paul says, Not that I've already obtained all of this or have reached my goal, but I press on to take hold of Christ who took hold of me. It's kind of like this picture of, how many of you guys like holding babies? Raise your hand if you like holding babies. Anybody? Not that many of us? Okay. So I don't hold babies because I'm clumsy, all right? So I don't hold babies because I know if I'm like doing the uh, Lion King thing with the baby that I'm going to drop them and then I'm going to, the mom's just going to kill me, literally, right? So I don't hold babies, right? But I want you to picture this. So Simba, right? Simba. So you're holding this baby and you're already holding the baby. And then what, do the, what does the baby do? Sometimes they're like, <laughs> right? Other times they're like trying to reach out and grab you too, right? And so the image here that Paul is saying is like, imagine a mom holding her child and the baby's also trying to grab the mom, right? The baby's also trying to grab the mom. He's like, Paul's saying, I am trying to hold Jesus who's already holding me. So Jesus already knows us. And Paul's trying to show us this image of us trying to know Jesus. We're trying to grab onto Jesus. Saying, Paul's, Paul's saying, I want to hold on to Christ just as Christ has already taken hold of me. He wants us to, to know, like, hey, this process of knowing Jesus, it's worth it. He already knows you, but it's hard. And so that's why he uses language like um, press on. This idea of pressing on is a, is a marathon runner, an athlete. And you're going through that last leg of the race, and you're tired, and you don't know if you can make it. But he's like, press on, press on. Some of you guys are going through some really hard things, right? The academic pressure, maybe it's parents, uh, pressure from your parents, pressure from your schools. Maybe it's mental health, right? Maybe, maybe you're screaming out to your parents like, hey, I'm struggling here. I have a lot of anxiety. I'm battling some depression. And maybe your parents aren't getting it. They're not understanding. Like when I try to tell my parents that, my mom's like, what are you talking about? Just do your work, you know? Um, and maybe there's some other things, some internal battles, some secrets that you're trying to release to, to free your shoulders from. You're trying to press on because life is hard. Following Jesus is hard. You're trying to press on. And Paul's saying, keep going. Keep going. Hold on to Jesus. Hold on to Jesus and let go of self. Hold on to Jesus and, and let go of self. Hold on to Jesus. I, he wants us to take, Paul wants to encourage us to take hold of Jesus. And when we take hold of Jesus, that means we have to let go of pursuing all these things about myself, all these things about getting into school, trying to go to a certain school, a certain number of points in a game, college scholarships, athletes, whatever you want to call it. He's saying, let go of self. Hold on to Jesus because Jesus will take you on a journey that you can't even imagine, right? And so, um, when I was reading this, mess, reading this passage, I thought back to a message that my youth pastor preached. And I want you guys to hear this. My youth pastor at home, his name was also Steve. Uh, but he said, the goal of the Christian life is to become more like Jesus, to be found in Jesus, and be so much like Jesus that we become indistinguishable from him. I'll say that one more time. The goal of the Christian life is to become more like Jesus, to be found in Jesus, and be so much like Jesus that we become indistinguishable from him. And I really love what he says. And, and, you know, the simplest way to say what he just said is the goal of the Christian life is to know Jesus. Because the greatest joy is found in knowing the greatest love. The greatest joy is found in knowing the greatest love. And that's why Paul starts this whole thing by saying rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Because when we begin to know Jesus, and the more we begin to know him, the more joy that we're going to have in this life. And when we stop pursuing all the accomplishments that we're trying to get that will fail us, and it hurts even more when you don't get those, you know, accomplishments, it hurts even more. When we pursue Jesus, he, he just won't fail you. He's the one that's already holding you, saying, like, great, keep reaching out for me, because I'm already holding you, right? And so, guys, like, I... I I want you to do well. I want you to pursue high excellence. But don't confuse Jesus for accomplishments. Don't confuse Jesus for law. 
Don't confuse Jesus for a strict way of living. There's no joy in that. Pursuing Jesus, knowing more about him, will change the way that you live. And if, if you're curious about how to start, read, one of, read a book like this. Read a book like this. I'll buy you this book. You can even have this copy, right? Because um, the greatest joy is found in knowing the greatest love. And so I want to I end with, this, with a story about a guy named Tom Brady. Who knows Tom Brady? Raise your hand. Okay, so let's get his uh, picture and stuff on the screen. So Tom Brady, right, Tom Brady is a well-accomplished guy. Um, I took screenshots of all the things that he's accomplished in the NFL, all right? And, you know, there's, there's two pictures, then he's on the Bucks, and yeah, cool. I don't even like this guy, anyways. Um, but I think he, he's, he's a great illustration, and here's why. So Tom Brady has seven Super Bowl rings. That's just insane, okay? That's more rings than Michael Jordan, and I love Michael Jordan. So that's another reason why I don't like this guy. Um, He's got three-time MVP, you know, he has most career wins in the NFL, most career touchdowns, most career passing attempts, longest touchdown pass, he's tied for 99 yards, and best intercept, uh, touchdown interception ratio, and he's just a well-accomplished guy. But you know, there, he did an interview after winning three Super Bowl rings, after he already won three Super Bowl rings, was already in the conversation for becoming the GOAT. He did an interview, and this is what, this is what he said, this is with 60 Minutes, if you guys know what that is. He says, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. Brady's like, I reached my goal, my dream, my life. And so for me, I think, God, it's got to be more than this, right? Like, I mean, this, isn't, this, this can't be all that it's cracked up to be. So then, you know, the, the moderator asks, well, what, what's the answer, Brady? He goes, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. And this is after he already won three Super Bowl rings. He goes on to win four more, breaks all of the records that you guys saw up there, right? He breaks all the records. Now he's the one up there holding all of them. He married a beautiful wife. I think she was like a model or something, right? This guy has more money than he'll ever need in his life. And he's saying... There's got to be more of this, right? There's got to be more. But the only thing Tom Brady can hold on to is this sheet of paper that's his whole list of accomplishments. And then when he dies, like, he's going to look back at his life and be like, oh, yeah, that was fun. But he still feel empty. He'll still feel so empty. He's pursuing joy, and he's looking for joy in all the wrong places. Sure, his life's great. But I guarantee you, he goes to bed thinking, man, there's got to be more in this. Oh, that Super Bowl was fun. I got to do it again. You know, there's got to be more of this. So the greatest joy is found in knowing the greatest love. And, and I want to encourage you guys to, to just study the person of Jesus. You know, study the person of Jesus. There's a phrase that, um, sal there's a phrase that goes like this, salvation, uh, salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So say, say this with me, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, right? Salvation comes through grace alone, by, uh, comes by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And, and when we study Jesus, you will see and understand grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. You will understand how much God loves you, how much he treasures you, how he challenges you to also be people of grace, and how he wants you to continue to grow in your faith so that you will understand that it's all about Jesus and it will always ever be about Jesus. So I'm going to invite the band to come up and we're going to sing a song called In Christ Alone. And I just, you know, pay attention to these words if you've never heard it before, but if these words uh, resound with you, if they kind of wrestle with you in your heart, sing them out loud because it's all about Jesus. I promise you that when you, when you come to know Jesus and when you continue to, to learn more about him, there's a joy about your life that will, that will just take over, and life will be different. You'll view life different. You'll live life different, because following Jesus will make you better at life and will make your, and will make your life better. So thanks, guys. Amen. Yeah, uh, can we all rise and just song a response? Uh, just like Irvin said, uh, the song may be new to some of you, uh, and there are a lot of words uh, for this song, but uh, 
if you don't know the song, I ask that you just read it, read along, follow along, uh, and really meditate on on these words uh, and, and reflection of what has been preached today. take a seat. Uh, we will have a couple announcements for you guys. Hey guys. Oh, it's working. Great. Hey, so a couple of announcements. First off, we are st we're still going to be off until um, September 10th. And oh, I got to get up here, huh? Uh, we're going to be off until September 10th. But uh, juniors and seniors, please tell your parents to expect an email from me tomorrow. I'm visiting a retreat site. I wasn't able to do that this week. Just got way too busy. So I'm going to be visiting the retreat site tomorrow to figure out what it's going to look like, what we're going to do, and uh, plan out rides and stuff like that. So it'll be good. I also will be emailing your parents a liability waiver. You can't go on retreat without that waiver signed. 
okay? Juniors and seniors, you can't go on that retreat without that liability waiver signed because, yeah, it just makes sense, right? Um, so September 10th, we're going to have a big event. You're not going to want to miss it. Like, trust me, if you miss it, you will regret missing it. Okay, I'm just going to say that. So more details to come. I'm going to invite our children's ministry. They're going to come up, or is it just Miss Julie? All right, just Miss Julie, and she's going to give a word to you guys. She's going to preach a whole sermon right now. Uh, you're so lucky because I am not. Um, uh, thank you so much for having me. I know some of you, if you've been at the church for any length of time, you're probably like, didn't VBS just end? Because usually I just come to recruit for volunteers. VBS did end, but um, as you guys know, every year, VBS is amazing because of a lot of you. And the kids love having, you know, all the catapult students as their crew leader, and the games are fun. They just love having you. And so we want to extend that opportunity to serve, continue to serve as leaders in our children's ministry. So if you're not familiar, our children's ministry is composed of two subgroups. We have Living Hope Little Kids, which is from birth to age five, and we have Living Hope Kids, which is kindergarten through fifth grade. So we would like to extend the opportunity to you guys to get involved on Sundays and help serve. So right now, because of where things stand, we're only opening it up to high school students. So sorry. I feel like I did this again because I did that for VBS. For now, just high school. Maybe later on we'll extend it to middle school. But if you can commit to coming at 9 a.m. for our staff huddle and then serving at 9.30, um, we would love to have you as small group TAs. We would love to have you for our praise team for kids. Um, you could do ABL in the back. I know some of our high school students are already doing that. And we also have CIA. Raise your hand if you did CIA when you were little. Yes, oh. it stands for Children in Action. And so on those Sundays, we are actually not, our goal is to have it fully catapult driven. No other volunteers if we can. And so you guys would be the leaders. You would be empowering and teaching the children what it looks like to put their faith um, at work. So if you are interested, please pick up one of these. It has all the information. And then the second page is the actual application. So you will, you will fill it out. You'll sign it. We need a parent signature because some of you drive yourselves, but some of you need a ride. And so we're asking parents to commit to bringing you on time to our meetings and to be here to serve. You don't have to be here every Sunday. We would love it if you could commit to two Sundays back to back. But if it's just one, come and talk to us. We'll make it work. And when you arrive, we'll have a log where you can log your volunteer hours. We'll keep track of it um, for week to week. And then when you need your form signed, we'll have all the hours that you served, and we'll sign your form and all of that. So if you have any questions, you can come to me. Sorry, my name is Miss Julie, if you don't know. In the back, in the black shirt, is Miss Chuhi. And you guys, I'm sure, know Miss Rachel, who's, you know, everywhere. So please come talk to us, even if you're like, I can only serve sometimes. That's great. We'd love to have you. So come and talk to us. All the applications will be in the back. And we have candy. So if nothing else, come by to say hi and get some candy. All right, thank you. Thanks, Miss Julie. Yeah, so um, you know, remember how like we talked about like the mother kid analogy, right? So if you're trying to serve the little kids and you can't hold babies, please, dear God, do not do not volunteer for that, okay? Because you're, yeah, that's why I'm not helping out, okay? So I know my role. Um, so guys, thank you so much for coming. You got, we don't need to put the chairs back because I don't want to set them up next week. Because uh, yeah, so. Hang out here until uh, the main service ends so I don't get in trouble. Thanks, guys.